If you have a Bible, you're going to want to turn into Luke chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 13 through 21. Um, Luke is in the New Testament, and uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's part of the Gospels, the four biographies of Jesus. And if you've never uh, read your Bible or, or never have started just kind of a regular Bible reading plan, Luke is a great place to start. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are great places to start. Um, and we're going to be looking at chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. And uh, I'm getting my phone out right here because I want to keep track of the time because, like I said, I want to give you an opportunity to, uh, to head out there. So this morning we're closing out our Upgrade um, sermon series. We started the new year, 2020, and uh, we're, we're looking at, um, at an upgrade, what an upgraded life looks like. Everyone likes to have an upgrade. Whether that's you're upgrading on your phone, you're getting a, a new phone, a better phone. Maybe you're upgrading your computer, faster computer. Uh, maybe you've been upgraded, ever been upgraded on, on a flight where you get a, a better seat, more room. Maybe you've bumped, been bumped up to first class. I'm still waiting for that uh, one of these days. Uh, maybe you, you've upgraded to a new car, new home, uh, new Shoes, I don't know, but you just upgrade because it's, it's taking something that was, that was okay, that was pretty good, but it's, it's something that's, that's even better. And this whole series, we, we've been focusing on how to live a, a better life, how to have that upgraded life. Now, when we say that, it's not about, don't, please don't hear us say, you know, that uh, living an upgraded life means life's always going to be good and you're always going to be rich and you're, never gonna, you're always going to be healthy and life will be no problems. That's the upgrade. No, that's not... That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a life. It's about being closer to God and living the life that he intended for us to live. So we, we kicked it off and um, week one, we said an upgraded life is a life that's focused on love, a love for, for God, but also a love for, or for one another. Uh, week two, we said an upgraded life is, is about a growing life. We, all, we feel like God has next steps for us that he wants us to take in our walk with him. And so as, as, a, as an upgraded life, uh, what we're doing is we're constantly taking these next steps in obedience with God. Then we said an upgraded life is a, is a life that's always pointing people to Christ, that you use your life, your testimony, your words, your actions, and you point people to him. That's where the whole uh, Gospel Conversations 2020, I, some of you may or may not know this, but uh, in the, this year, 2020, as a church, we've committed to, tr our goal is set to have 2,020 Gospel Conversations because we feel like that's what we should be doing as followers of Christ, is sharing our testimony, sharing our story with someone who, who doesn't know Christ. And, and, and this is about the people that you do life with, whether it's someone in your family, someone that you work with, one of your neighbors, someone who's, who's on the same team as you, in your same school, whatever. It's, it's about having that conversation. It's not about the, the conversions because you know what? We're not in charge of changing people's lives. We don't change people's lives. That's, that's God. God does that. But the thing that he's called us to do is to be faithful. And when we have the opportunities in our sphere of influence is to share, to have that conversation. So that's what that's all about. And you'll you see that total running out there. But we're, we're just trying to make that a part of who we are. So we said an upgraded life is a life that's pointing people to Christ. And then we said an upgraded life is a life that's filled with forgiveness. Uh, filled with grace because the truth is we've been forgiven so much and Christ has paid the penalty for us and he's given us forgiveness he's given us grace and so that should be something that we're about a willingness to extend grace and forgiveness to others and not be eaten up with bitterness and anger so an upgraded life it's, it's a love a, a life filled with love for God and others it's a growing life taking next steps with God it's a gospel centered life it's a grace filled life that's that's a better life. That's an upgraded life. And today our focus is going to be on, on life that's lived inside out. This is, this is the, the next upgrade we want to talk about. Now, I looked on Webster's Dictionary uh, for a definition of inside out, and believe it or not, it's in there. And it gave me three definitions uh, for the term inside out. And the first one is an obvious one that probably when you think about it, this is what you know. And it's, the definition says, in such a manner that the inner surface then becomes the outer surface. So... For example, the shirt was worn inside out. That's probably the one everyone thought of. The second one was, uh, the definition was to a thorough degree. In other words, you have knowledge. Uh, 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 you know this 
thoroughly. It, it, they gave the, the, uh, the example of this person knew the subject inside and out. It's like you've, you, know that, you know that textbook inside and out, or you, you've studied that, and, and you get it. The, the third one, though, was, was probably my favorite, and I think it best fits what we're talking about today, this inside-out uh, living. And it said it this way. This is how it defined it. In or into a state of disarray, often involving drastic reorganization. And so the, the, the definition, the, the example it gave is the CEO came and turned the, turned the business inside out. And, and, and I, as I thought about that, I, I thought, you know what? That's, what? that's what Jesus does, that he turns our lives inside out. He, he, he wants to come in and do a complete reorganization. He wants to come in and, and reprioritize things, and he wants to shake things up. He is not interested in the, the status quo. You see, Jesus is not interested in you living a good life, and Jesus is not really not interested in you living your best life. What Jesus is really interested in is you living a godly life. Jesus wants us to live inside out. And it's all over the New Testament. In your Bible, there, there's the second half is, is called the, the New Testament. And, and as you read those first four books about Jesus' life, um, they're all, you see inside out. It's, you see where Jesus has re, just kind of reorganized, reprioritized. He's just shook things up. Um, one example is Jesus didn't ask the, the quote, unquote, religious leaders of the day to be his closest followers. But he asked the tax collector, he asked sinners. He asked what people would have described as common, uneducated men to be his closest followers. Jesus gave status to women in his time who had zero status. He hung around the sick and the outcast, people that, that literally, literally had places that they'd given them outside of town. That's where Jesus would spend a lot of his time is with people who society said have no value. He went and he gave them value. He said that the, in, his in his teachings, Jesus said the first are going to be last and the last are going to be first. He said that if you want to live for him, then you're going to have to die to self. He said it's, it's not about a religion, following religious rules, but it's about a relationship. And here's a big one. He said, as the son of God, as the creator of the universe, as the one who spoke things into being, he said that he didn't come to be served, but came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said that if you want to keep your life, then you're going to have to give it away. And none of that, absolutely none of that, made sense in Jesus' time. That, that was, none of that was status quo. That's not, that's not how things went when, in Jesus' society, in society, but Jesus came to turn things inside out. And uh, An upgraded life is a life that's going to look drastically different than you're going to have than you're gonna see in, in the rest of the world. The world lives, the world kinda of does it backwards. They kinda of live outside in. I've got to get mine. I've got to take care of me. I'm not gonna let people get ahead of me. I want life to go my way. Life is really about my happiness and, and life is really about me. But followers of Jesus aren't called to, to, to live um, uh, out in, but we're called to live inside. And, out. and I want to read this passage here in Luke that kind of helps illustrate all this. And it starts in verse 13, and it says this. Someone from the crowd said to him, Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Verse 14, friend, he said to him. And if you, my Bible gives, kind of says, literally that word friend means man. So I can hear Jesus going, man, <laughs> who, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? He then told him, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. He then told him a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat drink and enjoy yourself. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And in verse 21, he says, that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. When you look at this passage, I know 
on the surface, everyone is thinking money. And some of you who haven't been here in a long time, or you haven't been here since, since the last time someone talked about money, and you're here again, and you go, there you go. That's what churches do. All they do is talk about money. Well, if you give us one shot a year or one shot every two years, then, then yeah, it may, it may seem like that's all we talk about. But while this passage definitely addresses our money and our possessions, today I, I really want to focus our attention on, on how it addresses our lives. You see, we're talking about an upgraded life, a life that is lived inside out. And I want to share with you, based on Jesus' words here, what, what it takes to live that inside out life. And we're going to go through these quick because, like I said, we're moving from here and we're going to go out there. And these are just four steps. And there's, there's probably more, but uh, in our time we have, I'm going to give you four. Step one is you have to adjust how you view yourself or how you see yourself. Your life belongs to God. So if you're going to start living inside out, you have to adjust how you see yourself, how you see your life. Your life, it belongs to God. And I love how Jesus does this. He completely turns things around on this guy who's asking him to deal with this inheritance issue. Now, um, basically what Jesus says here, he's he's saying "We've we've got a bigger issue to address here. Now, this guy, to be fair, he is not wrong in asking Jesus um, who, who many saw as a rabbi, he's not wrong in asking Jesus to help him with this issue. Torah law, uh, it, it provides rules for inheritance. And a rabbi who, who would know the Torah, who would know the religious law, um, would be expected to help interpret those rules. So this is not, this guy's not, this is not necessarily wrong that he's asking. But more than likely, here's what you have to know. If you, if you, You got to, the thing about studying God's word is you kind of have to look, don't read it just for here and now, but think back and look back into the context in which it was written. But more than likely, this guy who's asking Jesus this question or or for help, he's not a, he's not a firstborn. Um, You see, in in the Jewish law, uh, the religious law, the firstborn was always given more than the rest of the siblings. So if, if there were two siblings, the, 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 older, the older brother, the oldest brother would be given two-thirds and the younger brother would be given one-thirds. Because it, as the older, as the eldest uh, a son, it was his responsibility to keep the family going, to keep the family together. So more than likely, a firstborn wouldn't be asking another, another sibling to divide the inheritance. But this guy... He's, he's not necessarily so concerned maybe about what he's going to get because he knows, he knows how much he's going to get. He's known it his whole life that when my parents, when my, when my parents pass, this is, I'm going to get my share. But I think what, what his issue is is that it's kind of all left jointly. It's kind of all in, in one account. So he's not necessarily here thinking about family and how this inheritance is going to help family. What he's thinking about is, is himself. And here's what Jesus does. And here's what he's so perfect at. He looks at the presenting issue, but he goes right to the heart of the problem. In counseling, a lot of times, the presenting issue is is what you come in for. You know, maybe uh, our marriage is struggling. I'm dealing with, I'm depressed, or I'm dealing with anxiety, or I've got anger issues. That's the presenting issue, but part of the whole counseling process is to say, okay, this is the presenting, but what's, what's, let's look deeper. What is causing this? Why is it manifesting in anxiety? Why is it manifesting in a bad marriage? Why is it manifesting in anger? And that's what Jesus, it's like an iceberg. You know, you, you see the top. You all seen this illustration. You got the top that you see out of the water, but an iceberg is so much more. Uh, there's so much more underneath. And, and Jesus is the master of the so much more part. And he goes right there. And the brother, what the brother really wants it, it, it doesn't really belong to him. What the, what the younger brother wants is he wants, he wants control. He wants control of, of, of what he believes is his, and it's not really his to take control of. And if you think about it, that's how we live our lives. We, we want control. We want, we want it all, but the truth is, is our lives, they don't really belong, belong to us. We've, we've been made for, for something bigger than just ourselves. Psalm 103 says, acknowledge that the Lord is God. (laughs) That's a great thing to do. That should be what we do always. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Here it is. You are not your own. For you were bought at a price. So, 
okay, here comes the, the implication. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Your, your body's a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. So glorify God with your body. You see, God turns things totally inside out when he reminds us that life isn't about us. In fact, your life, my life, it's, it's, not, it's not yours. It's, it's not mine. It doesn't belong to us. And it's really, it boils down to, it's really an issue of stewardship. God gives us this life so that we can live it for him. Okay, not, not the other way around. God, I think a lot of times people believe that God exists for me and for my pleasure and for my will. God, you do my bidding. You are the all-powerful genie. And God, I rub the lamp. And here, that's not how, why God created us. We exist for him, for his glory, for his honor, for his will for his pleasure. God doesn't give us this life so that we can run off and live independently of him. That's, that's a foolish way to see life because we don't, it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to him. That, that's inside out living when you say, you know what? This isn't mine. This is God's and I'm a steward of what God has given me. Step two, life is not found in accumulating. True life is found in giving your life away giving your life away. Verse 15 here in this Luke passage, Jesus tells the brother to be on his guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Again, Jesus is, is going right at the heart of the issue. Being, and here's what I want you to know. Being greedy is not just about money and stuff. Did you know that you can also be greedy with your life? You can be greedy with your life. Jesus illustrates it. He goes on to illustrate this with, with that parable. And it's a story about, a, about a, a rich man, a wealthy man. Now, again, this is, not, this is not saying that it's, this is not talking against this man's wealth. And it's, don't hear me say that being rich is bad. Okay, but again, this guy, this guy has a very productive, he's already rich, but he has this even, even bigger, this, this crop, this super productive crop. I mean, it's, it's record setting. He had so much that the, the things he already had in place couldn't hold, the barns that he had couldn't hold it all. So he, has, he decides that, that he has to build bigger barns to hold everything that he's harvested. Basically, he's thinking to himself, he's saying, I'm set. I can retire. I can enjoy my life. Okay, side note here, there's nothing wrong with working hard, nothing wrong with setting yourself up to retire. But again, the issue that here that we're looking at is the heart this man's heart. You see, this guy completely misses an opportunity to give his life, not just his stuff, but give his life away. In, in those two verses there where it's talking about him, he uses, the word, he uses the word I and he uses the word my 10 times in two verses. 10 times I, my. Instead of being a, a funnel for, for God's blessings, what he becomes is he becomes this giant dead end. And it's all input, it's all input, all input, and there's no output. And that's not how God created us to be. You, you know how I know that's true? Take a breath and then just hold it. <laughs> and then take another breath. And then take another, what happens after a while? It doesn't work that way. We weren't created that way. We were created to take in and then to, and then to exhale. We were, take, we were created to, to take in, but then also we were called, we've been created to, to give away. That's how God created us. That's, that's the way that he wants us to live. And this guy in the parable, he has absolutely no inclination towards giving his life away. And that's not the life that God has called us to. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and listen to this, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19, 17 through 19 says, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or set their hope uh, on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good. And I love this part. To be rich in what? Good works to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age. In other words, getting ready for not just this life, but getting ready for, for past this life so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Jimmy, I'm not rich. I'm not wealthy. So this isn't about me. If I had more money, I'd give it away. I'd give it to the church, okay? But I, that's not me. 
I'm living paycheck to paycheck, so this really doesn't have anything to do with me, so can we just move on? Can we get to the part where you let us out early? <laughs> can we get there? But what did I say earlier? I said, this isn't about money. I'm talking about an upgraded life. You've got life. You've got life. Now, it may not be the life that you wanted or, or totally expected. It may not be a perfect life, but God has entrusted you with that, and he's calling you to give that life away in service for his kingdom. So you, you need to start asking yourself these questions. What can, what can I do with, with, the life so that, with my life so that others are pointed to God? How can, God, how can you use your life, how can you use my life to bless other people? How can, how can your existence here on this earth be channeled toward godly living that results in people being brought to Jesus? You see, our world is about accumulating, accumulating. Our world is about just me, just me, my. But God turns that inside out and says we need to be more worried, more concerned with, more focused on giving our life away. We need to not only, but we also need to exhale, inhale, exhale because that's the way that he called us to live we need to give our lives away step three you need to look at ministry at service look at ministry and serving as an investment in eternity look at ministry and serving as an investment in eternity the man in Jesus' parable thought his life was set he thought he was set he was all good but then things quickly turned it says, verse 19, he said, Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. He'd done so much work, but it was all for the temporal. And he forgot that life is about the eternal. And I feel for this guy. He was wealthy by all the world's standards, and I'm sure he'd worked hard, but he'd done zero for eternity. You know what those giant barns full of grain did for his eternity? Nothing. You know what those giant barns filled with all that grain did for the eternity of other people? Nothing. Because he didn't give it away. He didn't see his stuff, but more importantly, he didn't see his life as an opportunity for an investment in eternity. The question is, what am I doing to invest my life in things that go beyond this life? Colossians 3, 2 says this. Here it is. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth which have temporal value. Don't keep, this is how I, I, I I like to say, don't keep your life locked up in the barn. Give it away. Give it away. Galatians 5.13 says, my friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. Don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Hello? Guess what? That's exactly what outside in living tells you to do. To do what you want. You do you. Take care of you. Make sure you're good. Using that whole I and my 10 times in, in, in two verses. That's, that's, how, that's how outside in living. That's, what, that's kind of what culture would say. But that is the exact opposite of what God wants you to do. And look at the very last verse in that passage, verse 21. It says, that's how it is when you live, when you live outside in, it says, that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the whole implication is if you're living for you, if you're living outside in, if you keep your life in the barn the entire time, then you're not rich in God. Selfishness, selfishness doesn't build wealth in God. This me, myself, and I thinking, that doesn't build wealth in God. Hoarding your life Again, not just, I'm not talking about your stuff. I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about you, your life, your time, your talents, your gifts, your abilities, the things that God has, 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 has entrusted to you. Hoarding that life does not build wealth in God, not investing those things for eternal things 
does not build wealth in God. Living inside out, that's rich towards God. And let me be clear about what being rich toward God means because that's not about money. Being rich toward God means that you're first and foremost, you're thankful for the life that God has given you, but you're also going to be a good steward of the life that God has given you. Being rich toward God means you're giving your life to things that matter for eternity. And you know what matters for eternity? You ready for this? People. People matter for eternity. The people that you live with, the people that you work with, the people that you do life with, the people that you go to school with, the people that are at your your gym or the people that are in your club, the the people that you see out in the streets, your neighbors, people that, that, that's, that's what matters for eternity. People are eternal and God has called us to invest our lives in things that point people to an awesome, loving, forgiving, gracious, merciful, life-giving, peace-giving, joy-giving God. Oh, and by the way, that's exactly what we're about here at FBC Allen. You see, the C in FBC means that we're, we're commissioned. We're all called. We're commissioned by God for his mission to go and make disciples. And every ministry out there is about helping you, but also about helping others to grow in their relationship to God. It's all important. I said this in the children's sermon. It's all important. It all matters. I want you to hear me say that again. All that ministry out there, the ministry that we do as a church, it all matters. Look to someone next to you and say, it all matters. And here's the thing. You matter too. And so that means that you've been given a life, that you've been blessed with talents, with abilities, with, with, with gifts, things that you can do that God has uniquely gifted you to go out there and say yes to God and say, I want to be a part of it. Whether it's teaching a child to a, to a Bible, I mean, sorry, it's teaching the Bible to a child or a student. Maybe it's donating food to help a hungry person here in, in Allen. It's, or maybe it's becoming a, a foster parent or saying, you know what, I want to adopt. Maybe it's, it's volunteering to drive a bus that goes and picks up senior adults so they can come to church here. Or maybe it's a golf cart so you can drive out and help people have a better experience when they come onto this campus. Maybe it's, it, it's about volunteering to go build a, a church in another community. Maybe it's about investing in your marriage. Uh, maybe it's, it's about being a greeter so that when people come here, they feel welcome. They feel, they feel excited about being here. Maybe it's about helping create this Good Friday experience. It all helps point people to Christ. It all helps point people to Christ. And here's the thing. The best thing that you can do with your life is give it to God. Because it belongs to him anyway. Give it to God, which leads me to step four. And step four is this. You need to get up from here, you need to go out there, and you need to give your life away. 